Hey everyone, this is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org. We had planned uh, to host a live chat about the bear hierarchy today, but the weather on Dumpling Mountain didn't cooperate. Uh, so we lost uh, some power with one of our radio repeaters that sends the bear cam signal out of Brooks Camp uh, into the wider world. Uh, so I came up on Dumpling Mountain to try to troubleshoot that issue. The sun actually did most of the work for us and uh, the bear cams are back, but we still have to swap out some fuel jugs uh, while I'm up here. However, I thought this was a good opportunity maybe to show everybody uh, what the summit of Dumpling Mountain looks like. And if you have questions uh, about you know, the mountain habitat here uh, on Dumpling Mountain or Katmai National Park, I'll be happy to try to answer those uh, questions for you. So you can drop those in the chat and one of the helpful moderators from Explore.org will be sending those uh, in my direction. It's actually quite chilly up here right now. You can probably see that I have my winter hat on, uh, gloves as well, and I'm wearing multiple layers. It's, it's probably 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit cooler on the summit of Dumpling Mountain versus what it is down at Brooks Camp. And the difference in elevation between that location and where I'm standing now is about 2,400 feet or so. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's not very warm up here right now. It's, it's in the 40s uh, Fahrenheit, uh, so, so chilly. And that's pretty typical uh, for these, these mountaintops in Katmai National Park. We're very close to not only the Bering Sea, but also the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so we're in the track of a, a lot of storms that come off of, of those, those water bodies. And it, it gets uh, cold and chilly and very windy up here quite frequently. And that's why behind me, you don't see any trees. So this is what you would call alpine tundra. And it's a treeless habitat up here uh, on Dumpling Mountain. Uh, it's, it's too cold. The growing season is too short. The soils are too cold to support really any substantial uh, growth of trees or much substantial vegetation at all. Really what you're seeing on the ground here happens to be a few scattered willows, uh, some dwarfed berry plants, and, um, and a lot of rocks. And, and, and that's about it. Uh, this is a fascinating habitat uh, to get to know, however. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a walk maybe to try to look at some of these, uh, these different plants. I'm not sure how well my camera will focus on the ground in front of me. If it's too blurry, uh, my producer will uh, you know, maybe let me know about that. But this is a fairly typical alpine tundra habitat here in Katmai, looking at what is a lot of crow. So these these plants are, and there's some berries on there that are just starting to ripen or starting to form. They're not ripe yet. They'll get black, uh, juicy, seedy berries. And they'll like them. Uh, I do. I think they're an acquired taste, though. Uh, so black crowberry, that'll be important food to bears. A uh, plant that's blue on the tundra right now, uh, alpine azalea. And that's a little surprising at this time of the year, coming up on the middle of July. Usually this stuff burns out. Uh, or that, that species burns out by this time of the year. But that uh, finding so much of it, you know, again, still on the tundra at this time of the year really does indicate that uh, it was a cooler than normal uh, spring and early summer. And that, that trend is continuing. Visibility right now, perhaps, oh, Maybe if I'm lucky, uh, 30, 40 yards. So there's, there's really, uh, it's, it's, it's a great view when you're not shrouded in fog. But yeah, right now it's, it's really kind of just a, a, a dome of fog around me. So that's a little bit about the tundra here on, on Dumpling Mountain. Um, again, we were planning to do a live chat on the bear hierarchy and uh, we have some uh, today, but if you have additional questions that aren't necessarily about brown bears, but maybe about this tundra habitat and the mountains here, the plants that we're looking at in Katmai, you can throw those into uh, the comments 
and I'll try to do my best to answer as many of those as possible for at least um, you know a few more minutes or until I start uh, shivering too <laughs> uh, too much. And yes, the uh, the bear hierarchy chat will be rescheduled. We just postponed it. We didn't cancel it. We'll try to squeeze it in. We have a busy live chat schedule for you coming up uh, during the next couple of weeks and, and throughout July. So we'll definitely try to uh, reschedule that as best we can. You know, plants, of course, aren't the only important component of this habitat up here um, on Dumpling Mountain. And as I take a look at some of these other things, because we have a question here about bears. Did I see any bears along the way? No, I did not. And, um, that, that was great. Uh, you know, most bears are down at low elevations at this time of the year. They're they're focused on catching salmon, and there's really not a lot of food resources up here for them. Hardly anything at all, except for some, you know, some grass if they want to graze on that, or some sedge. But they can find that at low elevations as well, and they can also fish for salmon, and they're not going to find any salmon up here. One of the things that they might target later in the year, though, uh, happens to be uh, some blueberries. So this is uh, a blueberry species that grows on Dumpling Mountain, Vaccinium uliginosum. It's tasty oblong. The berries are quite small. They're really nothing like what you might find in your grocery stores or if you go to a blueberry farm and you and you pick your own blueberries. They're very small compared to that. Perhaps about as large as a wild Maine blueberry, if you're familiar uh, with those. So certainly nothing like a high bush blueberry, but it's worth, it's worth it for, for bears to utilize this habitat in, let's say late August and September to, to uh, graze on berries on the ground here. So they'll feed on those blueberries. They'll also feed on the crowberries up here. And then in between, when they're coming maybe from the, those low elevations along Brooks River, coming up to this habitat later in the year, they might be able to feast on some uh, high bush cranberries, uh, other berries that we call watermelon berries. So they, they, have, a, they have some options if they want to take uh, ha or have more fruit in their diet. What other animal species are found in that area? Wolves, foxes, or anything like uh, wild rabbits? Well, up here, occasionally wolves will travel through. Uh, you know, a, a fox could. Um, we don't really see too many fox around this area, and I'm not sure why. They do inhabit the park. They're more common on the Pacific side of the park, and they're actually maybe, uh, more common in in the town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away, and that's where the bear cam signal gets sent. But I, I've, gosh, I can't remember the last time I saw a fox along Brooks River, or, and I've never seen one on the summit of Dumpling Mountain. So they definitely inhabit the park. They're just not very common here. On th this, this type of habitat, though, maybe a moose will walk through, but they're going to be found uh, more in the mid elevation and the low elevation areas. You're not really going to find any hares up here. Those are going to be uh, those animals are going to be found in also in lower elevations where there's more cover for them. And in other parts of the park, though, you might find some Arctic hares up in this habitat. So that's a different species of hare in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, for instance, around um, the lava dome that's named Nova Rupta. I have uh, seen Arctic hares there. So those are a little bit larger then snowshoe hares. Snowshoe hares like more forested habitat. The Arctic hares will utilize habitat from time to time. Interestingly though, we have seen wolverines on Dumpling Mountain. So this habitat up here is um, is preferred by wolverines. It's, it's easy for them to travel across and they can find some preferred prey up here in the, the form of Arctic ground squirrels. And I was I was hoping that there would be a colony of Arctic ground squirrels on the summit still. They definitely uh, were chattering at me as I was walking up the mountain today, but they don't seem to be in th this vicinity. So we're not gonna be able to highlight those in particular, but Arctic ground squirrels, definitely something that um, ut utilizes this area as their home. And how high is the hike uh, to Dumpling Mountain? How long did it take me? Well, um, 
I'm going to step out. It's drizzle up here right now. Um, so I'm going to step a little bit closer to one of the buildings uh, to offer me a little bit of shelter. It took me probably uh, two hours to get up here. Uh, and in the fog, it's, it's very disorienting when you're trying to travel across this landscape because there's, you can see oftentimes there's, there's no landmarks. <laughs> so you have to be careful. Uh, take your time, maybe stop and really think about which direction you're going. A compass is a great tool to have up in this environment. So it took me probably a couple hours and uh, in total, yeah, it's about 2,400 feet of elevation gain. So a modest hike by um, Alaska standards, but certainly one where you in, in, in this weather, you have to pay attention to make sure that you're not, you're not screwing up. Um, not getting too wet, making sure that you have uh, enough clothing to protect you from the weather. And that can be a challenge too, because coming up through the grass on the, the lower part of the Dumpling Mountain Trail, the grass is just soaked um, from the rains that we've had recently. And that I had to wear rain pants and rubber boots coming up through that. I also had to be careful not to break too much of a sweat either and soak the clothing underneath. So when I come up here on the mountain and I stop, I don't get too chilled. But I definitely had to don more clothing um, as I, I got to the summit and uh, started to cool down from, from that walk. And the ground looks very uneven. Is it difficult to walk on the mountain? In places it can be, uh, yeah, the, there's a lot of broken rocks from frost heaving. Uh, that you'll find. So it's, it is very uneven. It's, it was your ankle, for example. Uh, the, the vegetation itself is pretty soft. So that gives you a nice break. Um, but some, but tundra, yeah, isn't the easiest to walk on, especially wet tundra. The tundra that you might find along the coast of Bristol Bay, for instance, it's, it's much, much wetter than what we have here. This is um, a fairly dry tundra, well-drained soils. And uh, it has more firming than what you find like uh, around King Salmon or Knack Knack uh, where the salmon have to come from to get to, to get to Brooks River. The that area, lower elevation, a lot more sedge, a lot more ponding water. And that has walking on wet pillows. Uh, so <laughs> that'll give you an idea of, of the difficulty of traveling across that landscape and why people uh, historically use the winter time to travel uh, uh, across it because when things are frozen it's it's much much easier and is that lava rock up here uh yes and no it's been altered and it's it's so covered in lichen right now that it's going to be difficult to really get a good at the um the structure of it itself uh but dumpling mountain is composed of a variety of like volcanic rocks and also rocks that have been partly that were volcanic and they've been partly cooked uh, by the heat of the earth a uh, long time of years partly metamorphized into a slightly different type of rock uh, but this rock up here probably was deposited uh by volcanic eruptions and i, I I apologize, I can't remember the exact age of, of these rocks, uh, but by volcanic eruptions from millions of years ago that originated perhaps in mountains like uh, Mount Lagorse, for instance. Mount Lagorse is a granitic body, and if you're watching the lower river camera, and the, and the lower river camera is looking out towards Naknek Lake, you, you can see Mount Lagorse on the horizon. It's a rounded mountain. That's a granitic mountain. So it was probably that that's the core of a vo volcano from some time in the past. And as those volcanoes were erupting, uh, of course, they were depositing lava and ash and other places. And um, this is probably, you know, the ancient results of that. So uh, Dumpling Mountain is uh, a not a volcano, but it contains uh, a lot of rocks. Are there any bear dens on Dumpling Mountain? Do, and do bears choose to nearby places to hibernate here? Yes, actually, there are bear dens on Dumpling Mountain. This is one of the places that I like to go to look for bear dens. And I didn't have the opportunity to look for bear dens today. But I have found bear dens. 
uh, on the summit or near, not on the summit, but near the summit before actually in, a, in this direction behind me. Uh, there's a video on Katmai National Park's YouTube channel of me crawling into a bear den. Um, and that was just right over this hill here uh, several years ago. So if you want to get an idea of what that what a bear den looks like on Dumpling Mountain, you can look that video up. It was fun for me to explore. And uh, I, when I have the opportunity, I like to poke around certain um, grassy slopes on the mountain. Bears in Katmai National Park, they, they like to go to places and dig their dens or in spots that uh, are well vegetated and are well drained uh, soils and also in, in spots that accumulate a lot of snow. So a big flat area like what we're seeing right here wouldn't be a good place for a bear to dig a den. But the steep sides of this summit area uh, especially in places where you might find some more alders or willows growing and a lot more grasses to stabilize the soil, that's what they're going to prefer. So it's this is certainly an area where you can find um, bear dens. I, I, I don't find them every year that I uh, that I come up here, but uh, if you if you look around and you search around, yeah, certainly you can find bear dens uh, on Dumpling Mountain. Yeah, can we see the equipment that's on Dumpling Mountain? Absolutely. Uh, hopefully my camera lens doesn't get too covered in, uh, in dew. And uh, hopefully it's not too windy. You can still hear uh, me talking over the, the sound of the wind. So this is the main repeater on Dumpling Mountain. This uh, sends the signal uh, wirelessly uh, 30 miles to the town of King Salmon, which is to the west of, of the spot. To get the bear camp signal from Brooks Camp to here, though, it has to be uh, bumped through another repeater. And that was the one earlier today that was losing um, or had lost so much power in the fog that uh, it had to temporarily uh, shut down until the sun uh, was able to power the solar panels once again so so that's uh yeah the sorry i stepped out of the way again but that's the uh the main uh dumpling mountain repeater and then this other uh fiberglass building here is actually uh what the national park service uses uh to for, as a radio repeater so for their communications for the rangers when they're trying to talk to their headquarters in king salmon this is one of the radio repeaters that they use i do have the door open because i need to get a couple of fuel jugs out of there and take down to the other repeater and replace those so hopefully if uh, we still have a lot of crummy foggy weather in the future um, those fuel jugs will help to power um, that other repeater so uh, we don't lose bear cam temporarily and what's the temperature up there? Uh, yeah, chilly. It's in the 40s Fahrenheit for sure. Not Certainly not cold enough to snow. Uh, but I do wish the sun would come out just a little bit more. I think that would make things um, a bit more comfortable. But speaking of, you know, of, of temperatures, and we, we've been talking about plants, uh, you know, during this, during this Q&A. You know, one reason why you find plants you know, growing so low on the tundra, it's just not because of, you know, wind. Wind does play a major role, but it's also because of temperature. Uh, on the ground, the the temperature, you know, near these plants is, is noticeably warmer than just, um, you know, a foot or two or above the ground. So when I place my hand on the ground, I can feel the warmth of the sun actually uh, on on the ground it, it feels noticeably warmer to me um, when i pick my hand and it's only you know and, and it gets up into the into the breeze it's much much colder so so plants up here they're adapted uh, to grow prostrate like this creeping along the ground perhaps to take advantage of that that solar solar heating ability of of the ground itself so they're looking to stay warm overall uh, Rather than if you were like in a desert, it can be much harder for plants to grow so close to the ground because they're they're 
because their their stems and leaves could bake <laughs> if if they get, if they get too hot. But that's not a problem up here on Dumpling Mountain. Drying drying out is it can be an issue for these plants in years where there isn't a lot of rain. Uh, so we might not have as many berries growing in this habitat uh, during those years. But I think this year might be a pretty good berry year from what I've seen so far. It's not berry season yet. If I want to pick berries up here, I'd have to come back in late August and September. And what protection do I have on the top of the mountain from bears? Well, I try to use my wits as best as I can. And the sun is coming out now, so that's great. It's getting a little bit warmer and a little more, more comfortable. So I try to pay attention to my surroundings when I'm walking, uh, making noise periodically in areas where I have limited visibility so I don't surprise a bear. I think that's a really important thing to do. And then I also borrowed a, a canister of bear spray from the rangers. So. Uh, so I can carry that along with me uh, just in case I get into a situation where I feel like I need to, to defend myself from a bear. However, I also think, and, and sometimes you could do everything right and still get into like a, a scary situation. But I also think, you know, if I, if I have to use bear spray, I've probably made some mistakes, too many mistakes already. So I try to make sure that I'm avoiding those errors. Uh, paying attention to my surrounding is really important. Uh, making noise where visibility is limited is also uh, extremely important. And then also at this time of the year, uh, I don't expect to encounter bears on the summit of Dumpling uh, because of some of the things that I mentioned before. The, their food sources aren't up here right now. They're down at those low elevations. They're down along the river where they're trying to, to, to fish for salmon. And just that little bit of sun did warm things up. Uh, for me a little bit. So that was comfortable. I hope, <laughs> I hope it comes back. And we're just getting a little bit of a view here. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it that well off in the distance, but just getting a view across to Naknek Lake as the, the clouds lift for just a second. This is what you're seeing over there just on the edge of the mountain is the uh, north arm of Naknek Lake in Bay of Islands. It's a remarkable place to ex to explore. Very quiet, a lot of sheltered locations to get out of the wind. There's also a public cabin in that area called Fury's Cabin. That's a, a wonderful place to stay. And when you're up here, you know, in the in the cloud and the fog like this, it can feel like you're on the top of the world. And then once the fog lifts and you get to see the horizon, it, it is uh, quite a, an amazing experience. And what caused yeah, the bear cams to go down? Well, today it happened to be the weather. Uh, it wasn't critters, thankfully, so nothing chewed on any wires or anything like that. It was um, the, the fog itself. So having cloudy conditions like this uh, reduces the solar panels and we'll walk over we'll take a look at the solar panels on on the dumpling mountain repeater here but when it when it's foggy like this the solar panels just can't uh, generate as much energy as uh, they would when it's sunny so that's um, you know, kind of the, like the main issue uh, right right now. Uh, we've also in, tried to install some uh, wind turbines, small wind turbines, excuse me, in this area. Uh, but the wind in the wintertime sometimes can be so strong that it just, it just shreds them. Um, it breaks them off. Uh, so they often don't last uh, as long as we, we need them to. Uh, so right now, um, solar panels are the one of the main energy sources in the summer and then um, in this uh, this big pelican case here there's also methanol fuel cells in there so and that's what I need to replace on the other uh, repeater on Dumpling Mountain is some of those methanol fuel cells so it wasn't critters thankfully it was just a lack of solar energy and uh, since it's midday here in Alaska I think uh, you know, our batteries are going to have a, a good opportunity to recharge.
You know, I was talking about bear spray earlier. Uh, somebody's wondering how long does bear spray hold a bear at bay and what does it do to a bear? Uh, let me let me go get my canister of bear spray. We can talk about that. All right. So hopefully you don't get too dizzy watching this. Again, the ground is uneven. Pull it out of the holster here. With bear spray, you want to keep it someplace that's easily accessible. So like on a belt, for instance, you uh, don't want to uh, you know keep it in your backpack. Uh, that's not going to do you any good because you need to have really quick access uh, to it. So uh, bear, what bear spray is, is it's a pepper spray. It's, it's a highly concentrated pepper spray. And unlike personal defense mace that you, you know, sometimes people carry in their pocket or their purses, uh, this is, is more concentrated and it can help in a, like a shotgun cloud pattern. So a big cloud instead of like a small stream, like you might find in personal defense, um, mace. So you, it, it's, it's relatively easy to use. It's very painful. Uh, it's, it's basically just pepper oil, highly concentrated pepper oil combined with an aerosol and when it spray comes out in a big cloud, uh, it gets in a, a bear's eyes or they inhale it and um, that causes them a, a pain and they usually flee during those uh, situations. Now it, it has, once, it, once the pepper starts to wear off, it, it has a little bit of an interesting smell and it <laughs> in that sense has been known to attract bears. It's certainly not a once. It is a deterrent, so it's something to use, um, and it says right here on it, uh, to, to deter bears from attacking um, humans. So it's not a repellent. You don't apply it to your clothing or your tent. You use it in case you are charged by a bear, for instance, or if a bear is showing so uh, such overt curiosity towards like maybe your campsite uh, or your objects or yourself that you can't um, dissuade it from approaching uh, further. But you keep it in a holster. Uh, I like to keep it right on my belt, um, and that way uh, I can pull it out. There's a, a a safety on it right here, so you have to pop that off. I'm not going to do that right now because it's easily it's easy to accidentally discharge these, um, and uh, if you get it uh, even onto your skin, it burns. It's very very painful. I've uh, talked to people who have accidentally discharged it and gotten it onto them, and they say it is really uh, it's just unbearable. But the advantage of using bear spray um, over something like a firearm, there's a couple of, of advantages. One is it's easy to use. So you, anybody can, can really use it. So you don't need any specialized training. You just have to kind of know how it works. And you can also buy inert canisters that don't contain uh, pepper spray, but they also but would allow you to sort of practice with the bottle and get a sense of how it, how it works. Uh, and then, the, but really the, the big advantage and the thing I like most about uh, bear spray is that it's non-lethal. When you're using a firearm to, de to deter a bear, unfortunately, almost always you have to shoot to kill. And I, I don't want to have to risk killing a bear for possibly if, if I were to make a mistake and, and accidentally get too close to one. So that's why I like using um, bear spray. It, it, it causes the bear pain, certainly into their nasal um, passage, uh, their mouth, their throat, their eyes, and it burns, but it's, it's not known to cause any permanent damage um, to the animal. And what's, <laughs> what song do I sing most while uh, I'm walking uh, among brown bears? Well, I, I'm a terrible singer, so... I don't sing, but most of the time, if I if I need to make noise, and um, you could say anything at all, because the bear just needs to know that you're human. It doesn't matter what language it is. You just need to know, um, or they just need to know that that you're human. So a lot of times I'll just shout "Hey oh," or "Hey oh," uh, as I, as I'm walking along, and. Um, it, it does get repetitive uh, over time, and, and I kind of get sick of hearing my own voice, but 
it, it's it's worthwhile and necessary in, in certain situations. Up on the tundra, though, when I have really great visibility, um, if the fog clears, for instance, then you know it's usually not necessary to to make any noise um, in that situation. It's really only when you have a limited line of sight. And do the bears do much damage to uh, the equipment? Uh, occasionally, uh, they will. They they really tend to leave um, the the equipment up here on Dumpling Mountain alone. We don't really see them even on the Dumpling Mountain camera. We don't see them approaching the camera very much. Um, and I haven't found any evidence on these structures of bears chewing on them. That's not the case down at Brooks Camp. Uh, so down at Brooks Camp, for instance, around the lodge especially the buildings are clawed upon and they're chewed upon frequently. So the bears do uh, often uh, damage those, those structures uh, quite a bit. Um, and I think that's mostly just a, a, a product of bears being, uh, or having the buildings so close to a high concentration of brown bears. And especially when they get well fed, you know, sometimes they're just looking for something else to do. Um, and you can't blame them. I mean, they're a bear. <laughs> so they're often, uh, yeah, just going to tear into stuff. Uh, and that sometimes that can happen as well if there's a year where there are very, very few salmon. And late in the fall, uh, the bears are, are hungry and they're looking to, to try to get some some last fat reserves before they go into the den. And there have been uh, times, like in the 1970s, for instance, at Brooks Camp, when we didn't have uh, really large runs of salmon and the bears did substantial damage uh, to a lot of the buildings. But thankfully the salmon runs have been quite strong over recent decades and we really haven't had the, the same issues. Although bears do damage buildings every year, I think mostly just because they're looking for something to do or they're just a, a little bit curious about our objects. All right. If you tuned a little, a little bit late for the broadcast, thanks for joining me today. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. I'm on the summit of Dumpling Mountain. I hope you uh, were able to enjoy getting a, a view of the mountain summit, uh, learning a little bit about the tundra. We're getting the fog and clouds lifting right now. So it looks like it could be a, a great evening, uh, but chilly weather up here, fairly typical for the summit of Dumpling Mountain. Down below though, there's probably just a ton of action going on at the river with bears and salmon. But this is a quiet place. Uh, it's the place that I often have escaped to when I'm looking to get away of, uh, from the busyness and the chaos of Brooks Camp. Uh, you know, especially uh, if you're working as a park ranger, it can be very stressful uh, to to be in that area, to be around so many bears and be around um, so many people and try to make sure everyone is having an enjoyable experience. So this was a place where I came frequently uh, to try to relax uh, a little bit. And it really is, it's remarkably quiet. It's beautiful. You have uh, amazing views of the mountains. So uh, getting up here, never never gets old and it's it's uh, a place that I, I have found a lot of comfort over the years and where is the dumpling mountain camera located in relation to where i am now it's due south so it is uh, straight ahead in that direction <laughs> that's not going to give you um too much much of um of a reference but yeah it's it's due south of where i am maybe maybe a half mile or so and right now uh we're basically looking at this view we're looking almost due east and we're looking towards the iliac arm of knack knack lake And ha have I ever been charged by a bear? If so, how did I handle it? I have been charged by a bear. Uh, actually, my first summer at Brooks Camp probably was, and that was this was in 2007. That was probably the uh, the 
the scariest charge I ever had. It was on the Brooks Falls Trail, and I just happened to surprise a bear at a, cl at a, a close distance. And what I, m the mistake that I made, first of all, wasn't that, um, wasn't necessarily like seeing the bear or warning the bear or not warning the bear of my approach uh, because the person I was with, we were talking. So the bear certainly heard us coming along, but it didn't move out of the way. We saw it, it was probably about 25 yards away or so. And what I, the mistake that I made was shouting at, right th at that moment, hey bear. And the bear didn't like it. The bear uh, turned and, it, and it, it took a few bounds towards us. It didn't get very close, thankfully, but um, the message was very clear in that situation. So, it happened so fast, actually, that I, uh, you know, you really didn't have any time to react. So I did, we just stood there and we let the bear um, break off the encounter. And that's usually what you have to do in those situations. If a bear is charging you uh, and you don't have bear spray available to you or it happens so quick, you're not able to get your bear spray uh, ready and discharge it. It's just to stand there. Uh, and let the bear make a decision about how it's going to break off the encounter. So that's what we did. We moved around it after it, it, the, the bear had moved away. Uh, but the Brooks Falls Trail is one of those places where you definitely have to pay attention. Um, Rangers and I, we're going to try to record a, a video about the Brooks Falls Trail and show you more of what that is like. And if you come here uh, to, uh, to Katmai, you come to Brooks Camp and you're looking to hike to the falls, you got to take the Falls Trail. Bears are used to seeing people on the trail, though, so that, I think, helps to make uh, the experience um, uh, safer for everybody. And also hiking in groups as well. If I had been in a group of four people or five people, even though even if the bear had charged, I mean, that the chances of it actually making contact would be much, much less, almost almost zero uh, in, in a situation where there's a group of, of four or more people. So that's one of the, the other things that you can do to try to stay safe. Um, in, in bear country. Well, I think I'm going to um, wrap up the broadcast here. Again, looking out towards uh, north arm of Naknek Lake in the Bay of Islands from the summit of Dumpling Mountain. It's been fun to uh, answer your questions, give you a perspective on the beautiful tundra habitat that we have up here on Dumpling Mountain. We have many live broadcasts in store for everybody coming up over the next um, uh, couple of weeks or so about bears in particular uh, down at Brooks River. So I'm going to swap out uh, some of these methanol fuel jugs shortly, and then I'm going to head back down to the river and um, you know get some dinner and do some bear watching. But we'll be back online tomorrow, myself and other uh, park rangers to um, give everybody uh, you know some insight into the activity of uh, the beloved brown bears of, of Brooks River. Thanks for joining me today. Again, again, my name is Mike Fitz with Explored.org. Have a great day.